Since the start of my career as a young physician, through to my current duty as the Surgeon General, I have practiced medicine and leadership. I would, I would like to share with you today a single, extraordinary experience that touched me personally, taught me very valuable lessons, and demonstrated for me once again that there is always more to learn about leading people. The date was Wednesday, January 13th, 2010, at 6 a.m., just a few hours after the catastrophic earthquake struck the city of Port-au-Prince, Haiti, with hundreds of thousands dead or injured. I was woken by a phone call from my commander. His instructions were very concise. We are sending a humanitarian aid mission to Haiti, take our field hospital, and be there on the ground as soon as possible. The mission was clear. To save human lives, time was critical, and the faster we got there, the more lives we could save. It was obvious that this was going to be a major leadership challenge. The, whole, the thoughts I hope to share with you today are based on my own personal experience, but they also draw on 60 years of experience in the IDF Medical Corps, where responding to humanitarian emergencies and disasters all over the world has created a strong organizational culture of leadership in crisis. One of the uh, leadership principles I believe in most is to always set the bar higher than what seems possible. We wanted to be in Haiti sooner than possible. We knew that with our capabilities, many of the wounded could still be saved. So we moved. We didn't wait to get all the answers. Our first and greatest challenge was to rapidly assemble 230 physicians from different specialties, nurses, technicians, and the logistics staff. As always, we knew we could count on the Israeli national ethic of rendering humanitarian help to those in need. Our people, with their constant on alert mentality, didn't wait to be called. Hearing about the disaster on the news, they packed the bags, left everything behind, volunteered for the mission, and within hours, we had a full team organized and ready to go. We packed 100 tons of equipment on two cargo planes, flew halfway around the globe, and landed in the disaster area in the evening. We worked all night long to get the entire hospital ready by morning. And on Saturday, 8 a.m., we were the first advanced hospital in the region, fully operational and already treating victims of the disaster. Another world compared to the other hospital. Imaging department, I mean imaging, my God, they have machines here. They have actual operating rooms and it's just amazing. But we arrived to an incredibly welcome site, the Israeli field hospital, the Rolls Royce of emergency medical care. Being, thank you, thank you. Being the first into the chaos, that's setting the bar high. Two days later, my people raised the bar even higher. We admitted a three-day-old baby who was bleeding severely due to a condition known as hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. Although we brought a lot of advanced medical equipment and drugs with us from Israel, we did not bring vitamin K, which was the critical cure for this baby's disease. One of my surgeons approached me and said, my blood type is O minus. It contains enough vitamin K factors. Take a small amount of my blood, inject it into the baby. It will save his life. I had some concerns about the possible adverse effects of such a procedure, and I wasn't willing to actively endanger the baby. But after a few hours, 
when it was very clear that the baby is going to die without treatment, the surgeon approached me again, insisting that we go ahead with his plan. Seeing no other option, I agreed. We took 20 milliliters of his blood and injected it into the baby. The clinical improvement was dramatic. The bleeding stopped almost immediately. A day later, the baby started to eat, and the next day, he was ready for discharge. I believe that keeping the expectations high, which wasn't easy under the stressful conditions in Haiti, helped us to generate an atmosphere of dedication and encourage my people to express their own individual commitment to mission. That enabled us to save more lives. My next lesson was about collaboration. In crisis situations, working alone is simply not an option. So collaboration is vital. It may be easy when you coordinate patient transfer or you share supplies, but when it comes to jointness, working together side by side, treating the same patient or in the same operating room, it is much more complicated. By the third day, we were in crisis of our own. We had only two operating rooms, working around the clock, and hundreds of victims in need, waiting in need for surgery. A Colombian surgical team approached us, asking if they could join. Thinking of formalities and of the potential risks related to differences in surgical procedures, I hesitated. But ultimately, I decided to bring them on board. After they set up in a hospital, I walked into the operating room and I was worried again. It was a tower of bubble. The patient on the operating room, on the operating table, spoke Creole, which was translated into French and from French into Spanish for the Colombian anesthetist, and from Spanish into English and to Hebrew for the Israeli surgeons and all the way back again. But within minutes, the spirit of medicine carried the day. And I saw before my eyes an elite surgical unit working according to the highest medical standards and in full collaboration. That Colombian team doubled our surgical capacity and together we were, ab we were able to perform more than 30 life-saving operations a day. After that, we were quickly joined by many others. Physicians from California, plastic surgeons from Miami and Tennessee, oral surgeons from New York, pediatricians from Brazil, and nurses from Canada. We did everything necessary to make all these very different people fit well into the life of a hospital, to work with us and to live with us, and it worked. It's easy to find plenty of excuses why not to work in complete jointness. But as leaders, we are obligated to overcome barriers of language and culture and to find ways to bridge differences in working procedures and legalities, to adopt collaboration as a strategy. Another important thing I discovered in 80 was the power of something I like to call shared leadership. From the start of our operation in the disaster area, we wrestled with many complex and heart-wrenching ethical dilemmas. Most of the time, these were matters of life and death. Who should we admit from among the thousands of people waiting outside for whom we are the last hope for survival when we have only 70 beds? Should we dedicate our limited resources to a baby in need for long-term rehabilitation when he has no family and no place to go after discharge? Do we change priorities of treatment when we, when we hear from a father that brought his girl, wounded girl in that she's the only survivor out of his seven children? Who should get the only available 
pediatric ventilator machine. A single preterm baby who will need it for a very long time to stay alive, or several other children who will need it for a few hours each coming out of surgery. This time, I felt it would be better not to decide, not to take all these decision, decisions alone, but rather to involve our staff in the process and decide together. So we created a system of ad hoc ethical committees composed of several team members to assist in making the toughest decisions. I found that this process enhanced our performance and relieved individual physicians from the burden of determining a given patient's fate. As a leader, the overall responsibility always remains mine. But sometimes, the guidance I need doesn't come from the top. Sometimes, the guidance I need comes from the people I lead. During our stay in Haiti, we saved 1,111 lives and gave new life to 16 new babies. We were part of an international relief effort, and together with many other nations, we tried to do the most we could to support a community of fellow human beings and to provide them a measure of hope. Since then, we have had the opportunity to aid in Japan after the tsunami in 2011 in the special humanitarian operation for the victims of the civil war in Syria, overcoming the barriers of a hostile border. And in the Philippines, after Typhoon Yolanda in 2013, deeply collaborating within a small, within a small local hospital. And in each of these very different circumstances, the same principles held true, strengthening our confidence in the ideas I have shared with you today. I want to take you to Haiti one last time, but this time on a more personal note. Several days after we returned back home to Israel, the phone rang again. And once again, it was my commander on the line. He asked me a simple question. How do you feel? I told him that I was very proud of what our people have done there in Haiti. But I was also deeply frustrated because the people we saved there were just a tiny fraction of the many others who needed our help. He listened carefully, thought for a moment, and responded with a single sentence that affected me deeply and changed my perspective. In total darkness, even a single small candle can shed a great light. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.